to all now today's class is on immunology uh, actually the immunology classes is uh, classes are spread uh, you have been taught immunology in biochemistry in your first year our aim uh, of taking immunology class is to cover the infectious disease part of immunology in fact immunology is covered in three uh, realms or in three parts uh, one uh, basic immunology you are taught in first year in biochemistry and you have extensive lectures in immunology uh, during that uh, year in your first MBBS classes. Then we have a small series of two lectures in immunology. This is basically a revision of the previous immunology but more importantly the applied aspects of immunology. And then you have also immunology covered in pathology which you will be covering in uh, yes. you, in pathology you will be covering the immunopathology uh, parts of this and if uh, since I have been confirmed that you are uh, that I'm audible and visible so we will start now. So basically immunology is a very uh, emerging and ev highly evolving subject in which new concepts keep, keep coming up every now and then. A very recent advances happen in immunology and its, uh, its uh, link with infectious diseases is very high because the immune system basically evolved to protect us from infectious agents and pathogens and in microbiology it becomes very important. We will not just cover immunology as a class today in uh, around two classes uh, together in one and a half hours but also we will cover immunology with every organism, its immune aspects will be covered with the organism. So immunology will be actually spread with each organism in a way. Okay. So just today you relax and listen to the basic concepts, it will be a revision followed by some uh, concepts of applied uh, infectious disease immunology which I will cover today which will be uh, relevant to you as your uh, microbiology sessions go on. My name is Dr. Ashish Chaudhary and I am an associate professor in virology section. We are presently going through a huge pandemic of coronavirus, the SARS-2 virus in India and globally in fact and which has hampered online, uh, which has hampered uh, classes, physical classes. That's why we are having online classes. Actually I love to teach this topic in in the LT with all students together in France so that we can have a uh, interaction with the students but that's not possible now so if you have any queries <coughs> we can discuss once the online classes are over and once, once we have physical classes uh, restarted. So immunology is what is immunity? Immunity is the state of protection from infectious diseases basically and the immune system is a collection of biological processes within an organism that protects us against disease by identifying and destroying pathogens. In fact, the way the immune system has evolved, it has involved, evolved with evolution of, the, of life and every, every living creature has some form of primitive or highly evolved immune system in, in itself to protect, to protect itself from other invaders or parasites or other pathogens which may have the capacity to infect that particular organism. In general, the two arms of the immune system are the innate immunity and the acquired or the adaptive immunity, right? So these are basics which you already know. Now, the immune system works with the help of, of the lymphoid organs. You have the two primary lymphoid organs, that is the thymus and the bone marrow. That is a bursa fabricus equivalent in chicken and other, uh, ma uh, ma uh, other uh, uh, animals in whom it was studied and discovered. Then you have secondary lymphoid organs. You have the lymph nodes, the spleen, the malt, that is mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, that is galt, that is gut associated and B, bronchus associated uh, uh, malt. And then you have CAT, cutaneous associated lymphoid tissue. So these are various secondary lymphoid organs the, the immune system has in its armamentarium. And when we discuss immunity, as I described the two main types, innate or acquired, what are the basic differences between the two? As far as the specificity is concerned, in, uh, what is innate immunity? It is the processes which are present innately, inherently, already present, which are ready to at least start attack to the pathogen to recognize and to alert the adaptive immune system of the presence of an offending pathogen inside the host. So it, it is non-specific, and uh, but then it's uh, the immune innate immunity in that in that uh, respect is less specific. Whereas acquired immunity, that is B cells and T cells, the conventional B cells and T cells is highly adaptive. Uh, response time of the innate immune system is very fast because it's already there and but the diversity is limited. It has no memory and the important cells are phagocytes and natural killer cells besides other uh, cells which I'll discuss down the line. On the other hand, acquired or adaptive immunity 
uh, is highly specific it takes time days to respond but it's highly diverse in responding to varied amount of antigen uh, amount of uh, organisms and their antigens it has memory and the important cells are b cells t cells and of course the antigen presenting cells which start the whole process of uh, recognizing a invader or a foreign particle or antigen immunity can also be classified as active or passive the active immunity is induced after contact with a foreign antigen or microbe and any of these uh, active or passive immunity whereas passive immunity is acquired is immunity based on antibodies preformed in another host now each of these can be natural or artificial now active immunity is after contact with the foreign agent so when do you get natural active immunity so that is understandable it is after you have been had a, you have been acquired the pathogen and you have been uh, you have uh, recognized and uh, had the pathogen in your body for example a uh, uh, measles virus entering entering into the body and inducing uh, a clinical uh, me me disease measles and then the uh, natural antibodies form and natural immunity happens to this infection artificial uh, activity can also be artificial for example uh, after vaccination so once you give the antigen in a vaccine form attenuated form or killed or live attenuated antigen uh, or protein of a pathogen to a person artificially it induces immunity in the host and this is artificial immunity active artificial immunity passive immunity uh, as i said is the uh, immunity, immunity based on antibodies preformed in another host and you give ready made antibodies uh, this usually happens uh, in the natural form for example uh, a transcendental passage of antibodies from other to fetus of the five class of antibodies known only igg is known to uh, traverse the placenta and reach the fetus and it protects the fetus against the uh, pathogen in in many cases it this uh, passive immunity can also be acquired for example administration of immunoglobulins to a particular pathogen or gen, uh, to or to uh, immunoglobulins in general which is against many uh, uh, pooled immunoglobulin against many organisms which you give to a person in certain immune diseases to uh, to maybe try to uh, thwart the immune system also we have the concept of passive active combined immunity when you give immunoglobulin and vaccine together so the immediate protection comes from the immunoglobulin the antibodies in the immunoglobulin and long term protection comes from the vaccine which you give the antigen and the body reacts by the adaptive immune arm reacts and protects the uh, Uh, individual and of course needless to say active and passive when given together should be given at different sites otherwise the two antigen antibody may mop up each other at the site and no response may happen from both the uh, processes active and passive uh, this is the, uh, known as post exposure prophylaxis clinically and this is used in certain diseases like hepatitis b in specific situations i'll discuss i'll be taking classes on hepatitis b tetanus and rabies this uh, methodology of post exposure prophylaxis using active and passive immunity is used now a little bit about innate immunity innate immunity is defenses against infection that are ready for immediate activation prior to the attack by the pathogen so they are there in the body and these are not just cellular ones these are general barriers like physical anatomical barriers the skin is a part of the innate immune system it is a tough layer covering the body and protects uh, pathogens from entering directly into the soft tissue of blood and causing disease mucosae also are an anatomical barrier in a in a way in uh, because the mucosa has uh, its own immunity so we'll discuss mucosal immunity in brief biochemical barriers for example if you uh, ingest a pathogen via food contaminated food or water the gastric acidity itself is a innate immune barrier you know the sebum in our sweat has fatty acids which are toxic to many organisms lysozyme in tears and other body secretions uh, is also uh, it kills uh, organisms and in in a way these chemicals act as uh, innate immune molecules cellular barriers like phagocytes that is macrophages now we inhale air so many pathogens can enter via the air the alveolar macrophages are there uh, actively uh, uh, trying to phagocytose any if they are able to recognize and uh, uh, they are able to they actually phagocytose those uh, invaders neutrophils in the blood natural killer cells in tissue and blood are other uh, components of the innate immune system then the skin if you if you talk of the skin keratin is uh, is a tough layer we have a chemical called psoriasin which is uh, antimicrobial activity it has against e coli and other organisms is present on in the skin is secreted 
and the fatty acids in the sebum are toxic as I des described. Also we have antimicrobial peptides. We have certain, I have a separate slide on these, alpha defensins, catholicidins are uh, compounds which are uh, antimicrobial in nature and they are peptide in uh, chemi chem chemistry. Mucosa has saliva, tears, the secretions and these, the flow of these uh, fluids washes away pathogens uh, down and uh, helps in, as a, in that way is a, a component of the innate immune system. The mucosa also has mucus which entraps foreign molecules. The cilia in the mucosa which propels foreign microbes out, for example in the airway and normal flora, not to uh, misjudge the normal flora, we have a huge amount of normal flora in the gut. We have it in the airway, we have it in the genital mucosae uh, and uh, you know what's the weight of the genital, uh, of the uh, normal uh, flora in the body? The weight of the normal flora is 1 to 2 kgs in all of us. So imagine bacteria, most of them being bacteria, many of them are, most of them are anaerobic bacteria, some uh, other facultative anaerobes and other small amount of fungi and uh, all these together constitute a huge uh, reservoir of organisms which we, which uh, which uh, eat from uh, what uh, whatever food we eat and they in a way protect us. How does the normal flora protect us? Can you think the normal flora keep the mucosa, the receptors of the mucosa occupied so that when a pathogen comes it has lesser chances of using its receptor to enter into the human host. So the normal flora is a good thing and here I want to point out giving unnecessary antibiotics uh, you're giving an antibiotic to cure uh, infection, that's fine. But if you give wrong antibiotic or prolong the antibiotic, you're also destroying the normal flora, which gets destroyed with the usual doses uh, many times. So judicious use of antibiotics is important, not just because of increasing problem of drug resistance, but also when you're destroying your normal flora and uh, giving excessive doses or higher doses or prolonged uh, antibiotics or wrong antibiotics uh, uh, has an effect on the normal flora, which decreases our natural innate immunity. So these are important points to understand here at this level. Then we have certain receptors in many, many cells of our body. For example, we have molecular and uh, PAMP and DAMP-like uh, molecules of which the most studied and the most well known are the toll-like receptors discovered in the Drosophila melanogaster model. Uh, and uh, these are transmembrane signal receptors present uh, on the uh, surface of the uh, internal uh, organelles and also on the surface of the cell. And they have a uh, Exterior domain, a transverse, a trans domain which goes to the cell membrane, and they have a inner domain. And the external domain is the is the one which recognizes external pathogens. And they are transmembrane signal receptor molecules, which are in numbered one, two, three, four, and many have been discovered till now. For example, we know that bacteria and certain parasites, many they are, they are recognize a wide range of organisms. The TLR4 is specifically recognizing gram-negative bacteria, fragile is recognized by TLR5, TLR2 and 6 recognizes gram-positive bacteria and some fungi, Bacterial, uh, some, uh, many many bacteria parasites by TLR1 and 2, TLR3 recognizes double-strand RNA, TLR7 recognizes single-strand RNA, uh, TLR8 recognizes single-strand RNA again and DNA of the bacteria by TLR9 and many other uh, TLRs are known. TLR4, as I said, is gram-negative or recognizes gram-negative bacteria. It specifically recognizes uh, lipopolysaccharide. So these are certain uh, examples of toll-like receptors. The exterior domain of the toll-like receptors is leucine-rich, LRR, uh, and uh, that's a basic thing you should know as far as innate immunity is concerned. Then you have cellular uh, elements of the innate immune system. Then you have something called as natural killer cells, NK cells, uh, which are, have a surface phenotype of CD16. And these are able to recognize and destroy, without prior stimulation, virus infected cells and tumor cells. Do you know, because of this concept and the other uh, newer concepts, you have a whole uh, uh, discipline evolving of tumor immunology. And uh, here, the, uh, these NK cells recognize early stage of tumor development and destroy them at the very early stage. So many tumors actually don't progress. Uh, further uh, because they are destroyed by natural killer cells. So we have a huge armamentarium of innate immune cells which are not against, alone against pathogens but also uh, many, of the, many of the cellular elements of the innate system destroy tumor cells. Similarly, newer, uh, newer uh, cellular uh, components of the tumor immunology are described in, in the cell immunity also. But here, uh, 
but these are the most well known as of now. These cells, once they are activated, these natural killer cells, also known as large granular lymphocytes, secrete interferon gamma, which ex now uh, becomes, once they are activated, they secrete these cytokines, in which now stimulate macrophages and dendritic cells to uh, stimulate further the uh, acquired immune system. So, they are a good uh, initial molecule uh, to recognize uh, foreign invaders and tumors. We all know B cells, the classic B cells, B cells and T cells we all know. But in B cells and T cells, we now know that certain uh, uh, B, uh, B cells, uh, are, which are now called B1 cells, are a part of the innate immune system. They are produced in the fetal liver and once they reach the fetus, they undergo self-renewal in the periphery once the life begins uh, after birth. And these uh, cells have a limited, uh, although they have a limited antigenic diversity as compared to the conventional B cells, I'll come to that down the line. The conventional B cells, which would now be in T cells, the B cells, the conventional ones are B2 cells. So the innate ones are B1 cells. Here you can see them. They are produced in the fetal liver and they undergo maturity. And this uh, mature B1 B cell has, its, uh, has IgM on its surface and other surface markers like CD5 and also important markers like CD20, 27, 43 and they are negative usually for CD70, the cluster differentiation molecules which are the surface phenotype markers used for identifying these molecules in the body in humans. Then in T cells, the conventional T cells are called the alpha, alpha beta T cells, right? We have studied that in biochemistry. But then we have the gamma delta C cells, T cells. These are part of the innate immune system again. These are found predominantly in the respiratory system, skin and peritoneal cavity. And although they don't express significant memory, they, and their repertoire of antigen is not as extensive, but they are able to and they are also of three types now, uh, the gamma, uh, gamma delta cells 1, 2 and 3 of which 1 are the most well known and predominantly uh, 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 available as a part of the immune system and most studied. Uh, and they uh, to some extent uh, try to recognize and alert the body of uh, an invading organism. Then you have a whole armamentarium of complement system which you have studied in your earlier year and uh, these are uh, more than 30 glycoproteins produced by the hepatocyte of the liver and they exist as zymogens or prozymes and they are activated to become activated proteins. They are important for lysis of bacteria, viruses, they are important for opsonization, especially for particulate antigens which and the opsonin uh, in this case C3B is the most important opsonin. Uh, in this scenario. They are, hence, they are important for immune clearance to remove immune complexes and to prevent the deposition in the tissue. The complement has three pathways, as you know, classical pathway triggered by immune complexes and is part of the adaptive, adaptive immune system. But the alternate lectin pathway are triggered by different stimuli and they are part of the innate immune system. So the complement hangs between innate and acquired. Some uh, uh, components which activate particular pathways like alternate and lectin are actually part of the innate immunity, whereas the classical pathways by antigen antibody complex formation and hence is part of the adaptive immunity. Now, if you see here, all the all the three begin with some uh, some uh, uh, complement protein is the act, uh, is the beginning one to recognize and start the activate the cascade. So the the classical pathways by antigen antibody uh, antigen antibody complexes starts with C1. QRNS uh, complex which activates C4, which then becomes a complex of C4, uh, C4B and C2, which, act, uh, which becomes a C3 convertase and converts C3, and then this con uh, activates further C5, and finally the uh, e uh, terminal membrane attack complex of C5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is activated. This is the classical pathway. Uh, which is by the antigen antibody complexes. But then the lectin pathway, which recognizes mannose IgA on the surface of certain organisms, activates via C4 and it joins the pathway here. The alternate pathway, which recognizes lipopolysaccharide, for example, here uh, is one of the recognized uh, uh, molecule, act is started by C3 and it, act it joins the pathway somewhere here. Right. So, ultimately, the terminal membrane complex is activated, which destroys the pathogen. So, the uh, complement proteins are a very important part of the uh, immunity. Now, now we come to adaptive immunity. And adaptive immunity, as I said, or acquired immunity, develops in response to infection and adapts to recognize, eliminate, and then remember the invading pathogen. It's of two types, CMI, cell-mediated immunity, which is by the T cells, the effector or the ones which are working here are the T cells, T lymphocytes. These are the alpha beta T cells, obviously, as I have described, compared to uh, gamma delta, which are the part of the innate system. And in the humoral immunity, the effector cells are the B lymphocytes. And here it's the B2 cell. The B1 cell was part of the innate immunity. So 
and in general the ratio of T cells to B cells in the body is 3 to 1. Now, before B and T cells act, they need to recognize the antigen. Who does the recognition? It is the antigen presenting cell. The an APC or the antigen presenting cell, it recognizes the antigen. The, the three important APCs are macrophages. Uh, you know the macrophages, which is a modified monocyte. Then you have specialized cells called dendritic cells. These cells look, this triangular-like cell has small dendrites on its surface and many, many dendrites around it. It sits in the tissue and with its dendrites, uh, which are thin, uh, long, go long away from the cell body or soma, and it recognizes the antigen and then they try to, uh, they have a process of engulfing the antigen. Uh, and similarly, B lymphocytes also can act as uh, antigen presenting cells. Now, once these APCs, main uh, professional APCs, are macrophages, dendritic cells, and B lymphocytes, other cells of the body can also be induced to become APCs, but the most important are these three. I'll give the, uh, start with the example of a macrophage. Now, once a monocyte in, uh, in the blood becomes a tissue resident macrophage, it now becomes an antigen presenting cell. The antigen presenting cell recognizes any foreign antigen or pathogen, engulfs a phagocytosis in the antigen, uh, digests its proteins, and it, it now uh, it, it has the capability of presenting the peptide which it wants to present to the immune system uh, by its uh, class 1 or class 2 MHC molecule, on it, which are on the surface of these antigen presenting cells. So once the macrophage here, this is the macrophage, one of the antigen presenting cells has engulfed some bacteria or virus or any, anything and now it has uh, digested its peptides and it has presented its peptides onto its surface uh, on the tip of the class 2 MHC molecule. Now whether the, depending on the peptide or the length of the peptide and other chemical properties of the peptide, also depending on the organism engulfed, the presentation of the uh, peptides will either be on the class 1 or the class 2 MHC uh, receptor on the surface of the uh, antigen presenting cell. In this case, a CD4 cell is trying to recognize by its T cell receptor TCR the peptide which has been presented by the antigen presenting cell. Now it's, the, it's, now it's when the adaptive immune system actually gets activated and becomes uh, active and uh, starts acting against the uh, pathogen. Okay, the other bacteria which, have, uh, which are present in the body, uh, which has, uh, one of them which was engulfed by this macrophage, the other bacteria which are there are now tackled by the immune system. And this antigen present, uh, presentation process is the crucial step for the in acquired immune system to act, otherwise the acquired immune system will not act. The TCR, the class, class 1 or class 2 depending on the uh, antigen presented cell, uh, the uh, receptor will present the antigen peptide to the immune cell. And the, this is the main interaction, but the other co-stimulatory uh, 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 interactions also happen between other uh, receptors and ligands uh, among these two cells for a proper antigen presentation. So this, uh, so, in, uh, so I'll just come to this slide in a minute. So the CMI is by T cells, uh, that is T lymphocytes, which mature in the thymus. And all T cells in the body express CD3 on their surface. So CD3 is a pan T cell marker. Now these are of two types basically, main two types, helper T cells which express CD4 and cytotoxic T cells which uh, express CD8. So uh, now uh, this acts as the surface phenotype marker in the body. The ratio of CD4 to CD8 T cells in the body, as you uh, must have read, it, uh, read in your earlier biochemistry classes, is 2 is to 1. The CD4 cells actually express CD4 on their surface. Uh, so this is a CD4 T cell because it has a T cell receptor which expresses CD4, here you can see. And uh, these uh, recognize MHC2 molecules. So uh, see, uh, helper uh, T cells which express CD4 on their surface recognize any uh, antigen presenting cell uh, peptide presentation from which is from a class 2 MHC molecule. The, these helper T cells are, uh, they are helpers, so they help other cells of the body. By secreting interleukin 2, they help their brother CD8 T cells. By uh, producing more, uh, the same interleukin 2 also helps in growth of CD4 T cells. So they help, in, uh, so CD8 and CD4 cells uh, help each other. So CD4 helps CD8, CD4 helps CD4 itself. Then uh, they stimulate macrophages by producing interferon gamma. And this is how macrophages get activated in the body. They uh, produce interleukin 4 and 5 and uh, help other B cells. Okay, So as you can see, the T cells help 
the T uh, lineage as there is a B lineage. So helper cells are very important in the immune system. And uh, if those which are most uh, help, uh, producing interleukin 2, gamma interferon, gamma and TNF alpha, they have a stimulation towards the CMI uh, and they uh, and they uh, they are called the Th1 response of the uh, T cell. Whereas those which pre uh, which predominantly produce interleukin, when the response is more producing interleukin 4 and 5 and other cytokines of this group, it's more towards Th2, which is towards the humoral uh, uh, response, right? So this you have studied in your biochemistry classes. This is just a revision for you. And uh, now, on the other hand, the cytoxic T cells express CD8. So that's how they are recognized. So now remember, CD4 and CD8 have the pan T cell marker CD3. So the surface phenotype of a CD4 is actually CD3 and plus CD3, CD4. Whereas uh, the surface phenotype of a tritoxic T cell is CD3 plus CD8. Now these uh, uh, recognize uh, those uh, peptides which are presented by an antigen presenting cell by its class 1 MHC molecule. And their function of the cytotoxic T cells is to kill, 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 cytotoxic. They, enjoy, they uh, destroy virus infected cells, they destroy tumor cells, and they also describe, uh, uh, destroy allograft cells, either by releasing certain toxic chemicals and creating pores on the uh, membrane of the cell which they want to kill, or by inducing apoptosis. Now, if you look at this diagram, this diagram kind of summarizes the immune system, the adaptive immune system. Once antigen presentation has happened, uh, happened a pathogen has been engulfed by a macrophage here, and its peptides have been presented here, in this case, by class 2 MHC. So what will be the, uh, what will be the cell recognizing class 2 MHC? It will be a CD4. Had it been a class 1 MHC presentation, it, will, it would have been a CD8 T cell. Now, once recognized, the CD, uh, one of the T lymphocytes gets activated and actually in, in most pathogens have both kind of peptides which can be presented to the MHC1 or MHC2. It's more like which response happens more in certain organisms depending on the nature of the organism, right, or the offending agent for that matter. So actually uh, or in this case uh, both Th1 and Th2 response has been activated by the helper T cell. The Th helper 1 response is activating the cell mediated immunity arm, CMI, by activating macrophages by interferon gamma, TNF, beta, or by the same in interferon gamma activates natural killer cells which helps in killing viruses and tumor cells. And the uh, cytotoxic T cells, the CD8 T cells gets activated and which now has its cytotoxic action which I have described uh, in a minute, a minute back. Similarly, uh, here a B lymphocyte is acting as an antigen presenting cell, presenting its uh, peptides via MHC2 to a helper T cell, uh, uh, in this case a Th2 cell, which now is stimulating the uh, plasma cell to proliferate and produce antibody to neutralize the organism and also some amount of memory B cells are being produced and this is part of the hemoral immunity. So you can see in a nutshell how the immune system works in a complex way but here I try to simplify it very uh, for you but it, uh, many many things get activated together and uh, this is how the immune system as a whole functions which you have studied in your earlier class. So T cells uh, are helper and cytotoxic, I have told you there. Here is your CD4. This is a CMI being activated by, by a helper T cell activating the CD8 T cell. The CD4 here is activating, uh, is uh, by the CMI, by its CMI uh, arm, DH1 response, is activating the CMI by its TH2 response, is activating the humoral immunity. Here a B cell is trying a similar pathway, is activating the uh, helper T cell to produce uh, to uh, uh, induce uh, the plasma cells in the marrow to become active B cells and secrete immunoglobulins. So CMI, uh, T cells, CD4, CD8, uh, T cells uh, are helper, uh, CD4 are helper which are recognized by class 2 MHC molecules, CD8 by class 1 MHC molecules, these are cytotoxic cells killing viperporins and apoptosis as discussed uh, a minute back, few minutes back. And then we come to the B cell humoral immunity. Here are the B cells we know are maturing in the bone marrow in the bursa of equivalent, uh, which is uh, which was described in chicken. Uh, these differentiate the B cells finally differentiate into plasma cells, which produce antibodies. And we have five class of antibodies: IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, and IgE. Here you can see a B lymphocyte converting into a plasma cell, which uh, now produces is now producing antibodies. IgG response is the main response, which is a secondary response, 
which uh, happens uh, in the body after a, a foreign uh, molecule or a antigen enters the body. IgG antibodies, like the IgM antibodies, are able to fix complement. They have the property of opsonization, where they can bind to a pathogen so that the macrophage can recognize and uh, phagocytose it. Uh, this is the only class of antibody to cross the placenta. IgM response is a primary response to an antigen. IgM also, like IgG, can fix complement, and this IgM often exists as a pentamer. You know that in your earlier classes. IgA is secretory IgA, which is not much present in the blood, but these uh, secretory IgAs are locally present in secretions. Okay, they are present in mucosal secretions mainly, and they protect locally uh, against foreign invaders. IgE antibody uh, mediates one type of hypersensitivity, sensitivity, which will be taught to you in pathology. I'll just overview it in today's class also. And IgE is also an important. Uh, uh, determinant uh, to uh, respond against uh, uh, helminths. IgD has function remains unknown as of now. Now, when we look at the kinetics of uh, the antibodies after an infection, for example, here I'm showing you a slide of, of uh, the kinetics of the virus and uh, the dengue virus infection. So, the first the virus enters the body and leads to a viremia. At this stage, uh, you can see uh, the virus is present in the blood. In, uh, in the uh, the first response is IgM, okay, and the IgM response then settles down. If the person is infected again, there may be a secondary IgM response. If again the person gets dengue, dengue by a different serotype of the dengue virus. But in the primary response, IgG develops a little later than IgM. So this is the IgG response. Now, if the pathogen uh, is uh, comes to, uh, in contact with the bad body again, if a body acquires dengue virus, uh, it gets infected by dengue virus again, of course, by a different serotype, then the IgM response is not so good in a secondary infection or re-exposure, but the IgE response is very robust and higher than the previous response. So this is, tight. this is true for many, many pathogens. So the IgM response best develops in the first exposure, and the IgE response develops after the IgM response, but the IgM response on re-exposure may not be so robust. But the IgE response usually is robust even on re-exposure. So this is to understand the health, the role of IgM IgG in diagnosis, which I'll come to down the line, in infectious diseases. So in a primary infection, IgM response is good, followed by a good IgG response. Whereas in a re-exposure, the IgM response may not be good. It may be good, may not be good. But the IgG, IgG response is quite good. Okay, this is true for many many pathogens. Coming to a small concept of uh, the important concept of mucosal immunity. One uh, component of mucosal immunity I have discussed is the secretory IgA, the Ig antibodies which are secreted, uh, secreted in the body secretions in the mucosa. The uh, one more important cell which helps in, in mucosal immunity, especially in the gut and other parts of the body, is the mucosal M cell or the micropole cell. The actual name is micropole cell, we can call it the M cell, is nothing but a cell in the uh, mucosal, uh, in, in the body mucosa, in the gut especially. You can see this is the enterocyte here, on the, on the left and right of it are enterocytes. In between the two enterocytes you can see a, a huge cell which does not have uh, microvilli or villi. On its surface it has clefts and it has a huge cleft on its inner, uh, on the inner surface of the body, not in the mucosal surface. And here, this cleft is full of immune cells. You can see B cells, T cells, macrophages, dendritic cells down there. And this cell is, if a pathogen enters via the lumen of the body, it is this, uh, uh, this microfold cell which recognizes. And further, uh, interaction with the immune system of the uh, to, uh, to, towards the pathogen actually happens in the macrophore cell. Now we are trying. We are now learning that many uh, infections like Salmonella, Shigella, have uh, the, the M cells play an important role. And when they are unable to, then only the organism is able to invade and cause uh, invasive disease. Okay, so the microfold cell is an important part of the uh, mucosal immunity, just like we had the IgA, uh, IgA antibody in the humoral component. Now we come to a little bit uh, applied concepts of immunology, and first is maternal fetal immunology. Do you know that uh, what happens to the woman in pregnancy? What happens to the immune system? The, the, uh, I don't know this misconception that the pregnancy is an immunocompromised state. No, pregnancy is not actually an immunocompromised state. The immune system actually remains intact in pregnancy. There is no uh, uh, immunocompromised status as far as the humoral or innate immunity is concerned in, in uh, pregnancy. The, uh, in fact, the immune system is quite alert and quite good 
uh, and receptive in pregnancy. It, the, uh, the, preg the fetus is a combination of the mother and the father's genes, not purely the mother's genes. So uh, external, uh, uh, so actually it's an allograft, the fetus. Okay. It, the immune system of the woman allows the fetal allograft to exist simultaneously and doesn't react to it. It is able to protect the mother and the fetus from infection from foreign antigens, in fact. The immune system, the adaptive, innate, uh, the innate and the adaptive in, uh, immune system arms are normal in pregnancy and they actually protect the fetus and they, they don't reject the fetus. The WBC counts are uh, normal, the immunoglobin levels are, do not change much either in pregnancy. Uh, the, as far as the fetus is concerned, the fetus also develops its own immune system as it evolves and, uh, and becomes a newborn baby. In the fifth week of the embryo, fifth week of the embryo, the hemopoietic progenitors actually arise, arise in the yolk sac and by eighth week from the yolk sac they reach the fetal liver which now in pregnancy in the fetal stage becomes the main source of the immune cells for the fetus as the fetus is growing and by the 20th week they reach the fetal bone marrow and the fetal bone marrow now is activated and takes over the immune system of the fetus. By the 18th week, the immune comp innate immune components have also started appearing. Okay, the complement levels in the fetus are low and by the third trimester of pregnancy, they reach uh, high levels and they reach normal levels at one year of their life. Okay, so uh, gradually the complement system also develops in the fetus and the first year of life during infancy. As far as the adaptive immune system is concerned, the CD4 CD8 ratio is the same as in adults. Fetal uh, B cells are able to secrete IgG on their own and even IgA in the second trimester itself. IgM antibodies start developing of the fetal uh, immune cells by third trimester of pregnancy and in fact cod IgM more than 20 mg per deciliter suggests intrauterine infection. Of course, this test is uh, crude, you need cod blood, it's, no, it's invasive, no longer used. But earlier, this was one of the markers when, uh, in earlier studies of congenital infections. I'll be taking your class on congenital infections, like the most important is human cytomegalovirus down the line. So, uh, we'll discuss those congenital infections in, in a separate class. Anyway, the maternal IgG can cross the placenta as early as the late first trimester, but the efficiency of transport remains poor till 30th week. So, only after 30th week of uh, gestational life, the IgG crosses the placenta efficiently. Hence, the premature infants are not as well protected to maternal antibodies as term babies. That's why they are more prone to infection. They are weak, of course, and their immune system is also not so well evolved because the IgG has not, the ready-made IgG is not able to protect the fetus, right? The uh, newborn and the fetus as they develop. Now, when we talk of the immunobiology of the maternal-fetal interaction, the fetus is dissimilar from the mother. It's actually a allograft, as I said, and the primary site of modulation of the maternal response to fetus is the uterus. The regional lymphatics in the area and the surface of the placenta, which cover uh, and are nearest to the fetus. The maternal, uh, the maternal, the, uh, the maternal immune system is tolerant to the fetus. Okay, and it lacks host rejection. Now, why does the fetal allograft survive? So, uh, as I said, the fetus is an allograft, and how it survives is a, is a very uh, enigmatic issue in immunology, but certain theories have come up. For example, the pre pregnant uterus, like some organs of the body, are, is an immunologically privileged site. Now, you, do know what are, you know what are immunologically privileged sites or organs? For example, you have the cornea, you have the testes, even the brain to some extent is immunologically privileged. Although, all these organs have some element of immunity, less or zero or small, small element is there. For example, now we know of CANS immunity that the CNS has its own primitive early immune system and some amount of cells do reach the immune system when required, the CNS when required during infections. Now, as far as the placenta is concerned, as fetus is concerned, the cytotoxic T cells at the maternal fetal interface don't uh, mount any much response to the trophoblast of the placenta and hence the fetus and the placenta survive and are destroyed by the CD8 T cells. The two compartments of the vascular compartments of the mother and the uh, fetus are separate, which keeps the immune system of the two separate so that there is no interaction much between them. At the transport of materials across the mother to the fetus, the control of cellular and molecular transport, maternal or fetally, is very uh, regulated by tight junctions, which are fibrinous coverings on the trophoblasts, and uh, these uh, protect any unnecessary thing to cross the fetus. Uh, and cause a reaction in the fetus or, uh, or, uh, or any consequences uh, to the fetus. 
And the placenta as a whole lacks class 2 MHC HLA molecules on its antigen presenting cells. So it doesn't initiate an effective immune response at that time at the surface against the fetus. The placental certain uh, local uh, substances and hormones produced by the fetus. For example, placenta, sorry, alpha 2 globulins, alpha 1 glycoproteins called SP1 protein, the certain hormones, human placental actogen, human chorionic gonotrophins, estrogen progestins also like locally suppress the immune system so that the fetus survives and is born as a healthy baby and no immune reaction happens in the fetus, to the, towards the fetus, against the fetus. The placenta also has a, it's a huge vascular structure with an immunosorbent role. So that's what you can describe all these points as. <clears throat> now let's come to uh, diseases of the immune system. How does the immune system go wrong? So till now what I have covered is our first class of immunology, basics of the immune system and basics of maternal, uh, maternal uh, fetal, uh, fetal immunology. Now I come to the immunopathology and the diseases of the immune system and the applied aspects of immunology. For example, the uh, for, for next first I describe what are the diseases of the immune system in brief. So each of these diseases will be, uh, will be uh, some of these diseases I discuss uh, when we discuss the uh, pathogens. So these will be, uh, so and much of it actually is pathology. This is not ID related, this is not infectious disease or microbiology related. Some most of these concepts are related to pathology which will be taught to you uh, as you read pathology also. But I'll cover them in brief so that you know uh, you can correlate those things at that time. So the immune system will go wrong in three ways. One is when the one or more components of the immune system fail to function, less functioning of the immune system. So it's an immunodeficiency state. Hypersensitivity is the second form of disease where in certain circumstances an excess immune response occurs and causes damage to the body when the immune system is responding to certain pathogens or other agents. Autoimmunity is when the immune system fails to recognize self from non-self and uh, it starts destroying its own, own, own tissue and cells, recognizing it as non-self and misjudging it and not recognizing it and hence such diseases are called autoimmune diseases. Right. So first immunodeficiency, which is when one or more components of the immune system fail to function. Immune deficiencies could be uh, primary or uh, acquired or secondary and they could be, uh, they could be due to uh, genetic defects. For example, most primary immunodeficiencies are usually genetically determined. You have, you have B cell defects like IgA deficiency or X-linked agama globulinemia or Bruton. These are relatively rare diseases, but they are important because uh, they are important to recognize. Uh, the pa pediatrics department of uh, Ames, Delhi has a huge uh, uh, gamut of uh, genetics lab which dis, uh, dis has tests to diagnose these uh, immunodeficiencies and we also have immunology lab in the institute. We have an immunogenetics lab uh, which does some of these tests and many of these diseases can be diagnosed uh, uh, in the institute. T cell defects like D. Georgi syndrome which is a thymic hyperplasia a related issue. Here the thymus is hyperplastic hence it's a T cell defect. Combined B cell T cell defects like SCID Severe combined immunodeficiency, viscot aldrich syndrome are rare but known and they have many of these diseases have been, uh, cases have been seen here in uh, Ames uh, because uh, they can be recognized and they need a high clinical suspicion at, uh, in, uh, uh, in most situations. Complement deficiencies like C2 deficiency which is one of the most com common complement deficiencies. C5 to C9 membrane attack complex deficiencies, uh, these are associated with for example recurrent Neisseria infections. Uh, are rare but well described. So you have primary immunodeficiencies, then you have secondary immunodeficiencies like infection by HIV uh, which targets the CD4 cells and eventually the immune system uh, is damaged leading to uh, uh, the HIV causing uh, disease, uh, opportunistic infections, tumors and death. Immunosuppression is the most common state these days which leads to immunodeficiency in, uh, in the human host and this is induced by drugs itself. So they are iatrogenic in nature. Steroids, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunomodulators all are important causes of immunosuppression and uh, the risk of opportunistic infections, fungi, bacteria, viruses and certain parasites is uh, very high in s with such drugs if given in high doses or for prolonged periods. Asplenia, absence of spleen, which I'll discuss today as a small uh, uh, class in today's uh, next ensuing slides, 
is an important issue which is often forgotten. Malnutrition, protein energy malnutrition, common in the third world countries and developing parts of the world, is an important secondary immunodeficiency. Aging is also ultimately immunosenescence is also an immunodeficient state. So this finishes immunodeficiency in brief. Hypersensitivity is when, uh, sorry, uh, under circumstances, under circumstances, uh, certain circumstances, an excessive immune response causes damage to the body. Here we have four types of hypersensitivity reactions, and uh, type one, type two, type three, and type four. Uh, so let's discuss in a minute each of these. Type one hypersensitivity is a rapidly evolving reaction occurring within minutes after combination of an antigen with an antibody bound to mast cells in a previously sensitized antigen. Now, if you have, for example, allergy to penicillin, if you have had a, uh, if you have ever given penicillin and you suppose you're allergic to it, now if you're uh, in the first uh, in the first exposure, nothing may actually happen. But on a re-exposure, what happens? The mast cells recognize the penicillin molecule and they start producing IgE uh, antibody which releases uh, which leads to release of vasoactive amines from mast cells and these mast cells now start producing a reaction some of them may lead to a severe sudden anaphylaxis and a reaction which may lead to death this is typically seen with penicillin and it may happen with even uh, uh, certain insect stings also. ATOP is a localized form of hypersensitivity which happens to inhaled or ingested antigens. Examples of type 1 anaphylaxis, uh, type 1 uh, immediate hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis or ATOP mediated by IG, IgE, the role, the cellular component is a mast cell, is for example uh, allergy to penicillin, other drugs, asthma is actually an atopic type of type 1 hypersensitivity. Hay fever or allergic rhinitis, allergy to pollen, house dust, animal dander, foods are also egg allergy for example, all come under uh, are atopic or minor forms of type 1 hypersensitivity. Type 2 antibody uh, mediated hypersensitivity is the, where the antibody participates in hypersensitivity or tissue damage by promoting phagocytosis of the uh, cell to which the antibody is bound by inducing inflammation. So antibodies uh, directed against the extracellular matrix uh, bound to, bind to that uh, the host tissue and the macrophages in the immune system now damage your own tissue. So it's an abnormal reaction which is antibody mediated. The, it's a rare but, it, uh, but diseases by antibody mediated type 2 hypersensitivity are very well described. Blood trans and these are IgM and IgG mediated, not IgE. IgM and IgG mediated antibody uh, mediated and hypersensitivity reactions. Mm -hmm. Examples of type 2 hypersensitivity are blood transfusion reactions, erythroblastosis fetalis or RH immunization which will be taught to you in gynae again and in pathology again, Graves disease, thyroid uh, related hyper, uh, Graves thy thyrotoxicosis, some drug reactions are also type 2 uh, hypersensitivity mediated. Type, hi type 3 hypersensitivity mediated is also known as immune complex me mediated hypersensitivity because here uh, once the antigen comes, the antibody binds with the immune complex, actually the complex gets deposited in the tissue and in the tissue the complement is activated, recruiting uh, le leukocytes and releasing enzymes and toxic molecules to cause tissue damage. Again, this is IgM or IgG mediated. The pathology in immune complex type 3 hypersensitivity is fibrinoid necrosis causing a necrotizing vasculitis as, a, uh, as the underlying pathology. Again, this is uh, under the ages of pathology and it will be taught to you in those classes. Uh, SLE and PSG and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis are examples of this. PSG and we'll discuss in microbiology with streptococcus. Type 1 hypersensitivity is actually cell mediated by the, not by the antibody mediated, type 1, 2, and 3 were antibody related hypersensitivity reactions. Type 4 is cell mediated by sensitized T cells. Okay, here you have two examples delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. For example, happens to many, many, uh, in many, many, uh, towards to many, many uh, foreign actions, uh, foreign antigens or molecules. But it's best, it's, we use that uh, in TB. So we use the uh, tuberculin test as a, as a response to look for innate immunity. And this actually is a use of the type uh, 4 cell mediated hypersensitivity as a test. And this is actually an example of delayed hypersensitivity. Drug related direct cell toxicity uh, mediated by T ACD8 T cells. An example of that hypersensitivity is graft rejection in organ transplantation, which you will be having a class 
with organ transplantation plans, uh, on organ transplantation in pathology and in uh, in medicine and other uh, in other in your final MBBS. So with this, uh, we now come to autoimmunity, where the immune system fails to differentiate self from non-self. Uh, when in certain circumstances the immune system does not differentiate self from non-self tissue and causes its uh, tissue damage to the to, to the self and the causes are multiple you know it's not well understood but what we know is it may be uh, genetically uh, uh, mediated or it may be triggered by an infectious agent and that we call as molecular mimicry or may happen due to a, a hidden antigen getting exposed uh, in certain situations. Uh, for example, if you are uh, infected by an organism and there is a certain protein of the, of the organism which, to, which is similar to a antigen in, uh, to a protein on our body surface, the antibodies against the uh, pathogen uh, will actually start destroying the host organism, uh, host antigen also because the, two, the organism antigen and the antigen in our body, uh, some other protein, are similar. So molecular mimicry is maybe a cause of auto is one of the recognized causes of autoimmunity. Examples of that are Hashimoto's thyroiditis clinically and myasthenia gravis are autoimmune diseases, right? Many of these diseases have a component of autoimmunity and hypersensitivity together. So, uh, once you are taught in pathology, the pathogenesis of these diseases, and in surgery and medicine, you will understand them better. Serological tests, you have a separate class. I am not discussing serological tests now, but I am just telling you how antigen-antibody reactions are utilized uh, in the lab to diagnose uh, infectious diseases. Similar tests are also used for autoimmune diseases. Okay, so you have precipitation reactions, you have agglutination reactions, you have immunoassays like ELISA and chemiluminescent-based uh, immunoassays. You have immunochromatographic ICT-based tests, immunofluorescence-based tests, and complement fixation tests. Some of these tests will describe with the individual organisms where they are, where they are useful diagnostically. So I'm not discussing those tests now, but precipitation reactions are when a soluble antigen combines with its antibody in the presence of electrolytes and uh, in a suitable pH and temperature uh, to form an insoluble precipitate. And flocculation is one example of precipitation when instead of sedimenting the, the antigen-antibody soluble, soluble complexes, precipitate as flocules. One of the important tests of flocculation, a precipitation reaction, is the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory test in syphilis. You will, again, in syphilis class, we will discuss this test in detail. So at this moment, just don't bother much about uh, these uh, uh, applied tissues, uh, applied issues, because each of them will be discussed with the individual organism also. So this is just an introduction class to give you an overview of immunology and its applied aspects. Agglutination reactions is when a particulate antigen combines with its antibody and forms agglutinated clumps. So you can see here clumping at the bottom of the tube. Uh, and uh, this, uh, an example of this antigen-antibody test, serological test, is Vidal test for enteric fever, which is a combination of typhoid and paratyphoid fevers. This is an example here. This Vidal test is an example of tube agglutination test. And we will discuss these tests with the enteric fever typhoid class. ELISA. We have, you all had studied ELISA in, in biochemistry also, where suppose you want to detect antigen, you code the anti antigen in the well, and then once the antibody binds to the antigen, you use a secondary antibody which is conjugated to an enzyme, and this is known as the conjugate, and then you add a substrate chromo a chromophore complex to detect the uh, complexes, uh, the binding by uh, a photospectrometer. So these are tests which are applied immunological tests. So uh, we know that different enzymes labels which we use the in the secondary antibody here E, the S S is always with the chromophore. You know that Chromo, uh, the chromophore. Sorry. So the HRP enzyme uh, from the house radish has the is uh, the substrate substrate for this is H2O2 and various chromophores can be used. The most common chromophore used in ELISAs is TMB tetramethylbenzidine. So tetramethylbenzidine. Uh, and the uh, H2O2 complex is acted upon by hydrogen peroxide and this leads to the color change. Similarly, alkaline phosphatase from the calf intestine, the PNPP is the substrate and the chromophore together. Be if you are using beta-galactoside based systems, the ONPG, o nitrophenyl beta d galactopyranocide is the substrate chromophore complex. If you are using urease as the enzyme from jack bean uh, plant, urea is the substrate and bromocrisol is the chromophore. So some of these, uh, some of these chemicals are act, as, uh, act as substrate and chromophore together. Some are a complex of two different compounds and different enzyme systems are used in enzyme immunoassays uh, to diagnose infectious diseases. 
in for these serological tests. Similar applications are for rapid tests for point of care, commonly used for HIV, dengue, and other infections. Uh, hepatitis, hepatitis B, surface antigen, for example. They can be used for antigen or antibody. And these will be, you have a separate class on immunological tests, so I'm not uh, discussing them in detail. Immunofluorescence is using uh, a chromophore fluorescent labeled antibody to detect the organism, either antigen or in, uh, in case you can use it for antibody also. Uh, so, these will be taught to you in separate class. Uh, in, uh, in my CMB class, I'll discuss the PP65 assay for cytomegalovirus. So, these will be discussed down the line. But before I finish uh, the ap application class, a few points about uh, the utility of these IgM and IgG antibodies. As I told you in the beginning, uh, in, the, in the, some earlier slides, that the first response, uh, primary response to an antigen or a foreign molecule is an IgM response followed by an IgG response. Okay, so what's the clinical importance of IgM and IgG? IgM is very easy to understand, right? It's an IgM antibody against an organism indicates acute infection by the organism, right? Okay, uh, just to tell you that, an, a positive IgM indic uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a marker for acute infection. But please remember these few points which will help you to understand the implications of understanding an IgM report or a test. There are certain issues in IgM determination. Although, most of the time, when, uh, when, we, uh, when we say we are able to detect by ELISA, for example, an IgM antibody to say rubella virus or a, to any virus or a bacteria or a fungus or any organism for which uh, a validated test is available. Please remember that IgM, uh, as an undergraduate, please understand these concepts because these are not available and are not taught in medical schools most of the time. That IgM, uh, certain issues in IgM have to be understood. Once, uh, suppose in a latent virus infection or a reinfection by organism or by, um, uh, by vaccination, if you again, a, a, a human host or anybody gets exposed to an organism again, okay, for example, uh, you are reinfected by a same virus again, uh, or you are uh, a virus or any organism sits in the human body as a latent uh, organism and reactivates. In that situation, on primary exposure, IgM will develop well. So primary infection, no issue with IgM. But development of IgM with a reactivation, reinfection or vaccination, if you have had a response to the organism earlier, may not happen very well. Although IgG will rise anamnestically to high levels in this uh, secondary response, so IgM may not develop, response may not develop on reactivation, reinfection or vaccination. Also, Remember, in neonates or infants who have a, still the immune system is developing, uh, the IgM response to an organism may not happen if the infant is exposed to an organism. So, if you're looking for, see, if I want to diagnose congenital CMV infection, I want to look for IgM in the baby. Remember that many babies, uh, a good fraction of babies, up to 10% of all babies, may not respond, normal healthy babies, not immune deficient babies. I'm talking about healthy neonates. May not respond to, may not develop an IgM to a, uh, to a uh, organism. So remember, the uh, also in the elderly in immunosenescent uh, states, IgM response may be blunted. Okay. Uh, now, if you have an infection by a related virus, suppose you have an infection by a flavivirus, say dengue. Uh, in that situation, now if you are ex uh, exposed to a similar virus like ja Japanese encephalitis virus of the same group, the IgM response may not develop to the other one. On the other hand, cross reactions may lead to a false positive IgM uh, by Organism uh, to the uh, uh, organism, whereas the uh, uh, because uh, the uh, for example, let me explain by a similar example. You may have been exposed to dengue virus. Okay, so you have and a similar protein ha is there in the similar family virus in say in Japanese encephalitis virus. So because this cross reaction, suppose you have dengue infection, you may also get a false positive IgM response to JE virus. So. Uh, Closely related viruses who have closely related strains and antigens or proteins in them, the IgM response may develop to many of these uh, related viruses. So uh, don't just uh, so you have to think very logically when you are responding uh, when you are uh, evaluating an IgM response. Okay, most of the time it's right, it's fine, but many times you get uh, false positive and false negative reactions because of these issues. For example, rheumatoid factor, which is an acute phase reactant, may lead to a false specific, uh, false positive IgM uh, in, uh, in, any, in any acute illness. Also, it's known, unlike IgG, which may persist for life, but here uh, IgM, which is usually an acute state, um, acute uh, infectious disease marker, may persist in certain individuals. For example, in chikungunya virus, the IgM persists for months to years. 
So if a patient has joint pain, it does not necessarily mean the IgM is due to a present event. He may have had chikungunya two years back and this present joint pain may, uh, may uh, the, the IgM which you are getting may not be due to chikungunya. It may be the persistence of antibody which has been there for the last two years. So uh, very careful to interpret IgM, interpret, uh, IgM serological tests, especially with uh, immune diseases and with infectious diseases. Similarly, what is the utility of IgG? IG, after IgM response, used as a primary marker for acute infection, IgG comes and usually persists for months to years, depending on the pathogen. So, IgG response is not used as an acute phase uh, diagnostic marker, but, it's for, uh, but, but needless to say, it has very important uh, diagnostic implications and uses. For example, IgG uh, to, an, to an organism indicates past exposure or past infection. IgG response to a pathogen is, a, is an important uh, marker to, for seroepidemiology to look for the prevalence of the organism in the population. For example, if I want to see what is the prevalence of rubella in young adults in India, I can go to the community and take the blood sample and do an IgG ELISA and see how many of these individuals, healthy individuals were exposed to IgG rubella virus as young adults. So IgG has, has a very important role in seroepidemiology. Okay. Now, IgG is, uh, antibody can also develop in early acute infection in the early phase and this may help to differentiate primary from secondary infections. So if you have high IgG to an organism and in the, in the acute phase of illness, this may actually be a secondary response or a secondary exposure to the organism. So uh, IgG also helps us to differentiate in certain situations, not always, an acute infection from a uh, secondary infection, a primary infection from a secondary infection actually. Uh, IgG response after the vaccine has been given to an organism, presence of IgG indicates successful vaccination. Okay. In a transplant setting, I have a separate task with you in the fifth semester on transplant infections. Here, the IgG status of certain viruses is helpful in deciding therapy. Okay. So, I will discuss that. The donor receptor status of IgG is important in pre-transplant workup in solid organ transplant and hemopoietic stem cell transplant. Also, I, I, IgG avidity, avidity tests are available, which will be taught to you in the immunological reaction class, and these help in differentiating primary and secondary infections in certain situations. So, IgG antibody response, although not a useful marker for acute infection, in more, many, in, uh, unlike IgM, which is, IgG has important roles in diagnosis and seroepidemiology and therapeutic decisions in transplant patients, for example. So, we'll discuss these individual examples in the next one year as we teach you. Uh, infectious diseases and microbiological pathogens, bacteria, virus, fungi and parasites, right. So with this now I come to one concept of antibody as a cause of immune enhancement and enhancement of immunity and disease. The classical example is ADE phenomena or antibody dependent phenomena seen in dengue, okay. This, uh, one second, excuse me. Harujan. I'm in a UG class. I'll just call you back. Two minutes. Huh? Huh. Just five minutes. I'll call you back. ADE or antibody dependent enhancement is described in dengue. What happens is in dengue, this is known as the Halstead's theory, theory of immune enhancement. Once the person is first exposed to dengue virus in a primary infection, the B and T cells uh, reaction happens like to any other infection, infectious pathogen. And here, the antibody is able to neutralize the virus which enters the macrophage or monocyte. And here, the immune complex uh, are uh, destroyed inside the endocytic vacuole. Now, if the person is again exposed to dengue, not by the same serotype, because if the person is exposed to the same serotype, they'll be uh, they'll be neutralizing antibody and the virus will be neutralized. In if you are exposed to dengue by a different serotype, because dengue has four serotypes. Now, first, for example, if the person was exposed to dengue 1 earlier and now has been exposed to dengue 2 type of virus, here, the memory B cells which are there, which are memory B cells which are activated, remembering the previous dengue type 1 infection, will start producing the antibody to dengue 1, the memory B cells against dengue 1, and will neutralize, try to, try to neutralize dengue 2 virus, but they will not be able to fully neutralize because they are, this time the virus is the dengue 2 virus, this is this time shown in blue color. Here, the, earlier it was a red color dengue 1, now it's dengue 2. Here, the immune complexes, although they will enter the macrophage using the FC portion of the antibody, but inside the vacuole, the, inside the endocytic vacuole, the complex will not be destroyed because the neutralizing activity of the dengue 1 antibody to dengue 2 is not there much. So, the virus will actually replicate inside the monocyte and lead to a cytokine storm and lead to disease. So, 
this is uh, an uh, this is one applied aspect of immunopathogenesis where antibody dependent enhancement leads to severe disease okay this is i have a separate class with you on dengue i'll discuss this again in uh, that class also so uh, then we come to one state of immunodeficiency that is opsi overwhelming post splenectomy infections in this situation once a person uh, doesn't have a uh, spleen which is a very important lymphoid organ a secondary lymphoid organ i told you in the beginning severe infections including fatal septicemia can develop in persons with structural or functional asplenia or a hyperfunctioning spleen so children and adults both are at high risk of developing opsi or overwhelming post splenectomy infection and with high mortality if such infections are not recognized on time so in uh, spleen may be absent due to a surgery following trauma or certain cancers or in congenital uh, uh, situations where the spleen may not have developed embryologically for example ivy mark syndrome where you have congenital asplenia with cardiovascular and gut abnormalities or functional hyperspenia with say sickle cell disease and a myriad of diseases which will be taught down the line where the spleen is there but it is functionally not fully working hypospenism it's called as in such situations the the function of the spleen are gone so there is no opsonization which the spleen does no macrophage uh, activity or at the at the marginal b zone of spleen the filtering action of spleen is not there the reservoir of rbcs and platelets and wbcs is not there so and it and it uh, does mean an important function of spleen which is hemocatharsis is not there removing the senescent rbcs and platelets and this leads to changes in the Uh, body which are morphologically represented by hovel jelly bodies in the rbcs and as uh, pox on the rbc which you see on uh, a higher level microscopy like phase contrast or electron microscopy and these are markers of asplenia and infection in such a person with asplenia could be a medical emergency with a prodrome of chills pharyngitis vomiting diarrhea rigors Uh, and then fo focal localization in meningitis in children below 5 years and then abruptly uh, abruptly progressing to within hours not days to shock disseminated intravascular coagulation taught to you will be taught you in pathology in hematology uh, 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 and seizures coma pulp purpura with uh, uh, hemorrhages in the skin sometimes with hemorrhagic adrenal gland abnormality leading to acute adrenalitis causing waterhouse uh, water waterhouse fredrickson syndrome even amputation of the uh, limbs and uh, uh, may happen and this is a very with high mortality uh, and death so spleen so and the most important organisms in this group the most common one organism are, are the usual organisms are encapsulated bacteria for example pneumococcus is the most common bacteria 67% of the, or opsi is caused by pneumococcus h influenza type b 8% and other organisms constitute smaller fraction even parasites like hemoparasites like plasmodium and babesia may also contribute luckily you can diagnose by doing blood culture or smears and rapid tests and procalcitonin which is a sepsis marker which will talk to you in sepsis class to diagnose and you have immediate therapy with antibiotics or Uh, therapeutic interventions before results are available with combination of antibiotics and prophylactic antimicrobials for example penicillin v in certain situations and vaccines like new vaccines for pneumococcus h influenza meningococcus etc must be used in such patients and last i finish this class with monoclonal antibodies where an important uh, era of uh, immunology has come where you have antibodies which have been produced monoclonally which technique is used for monoclonal antibodies the hybridoma technology right so you know you fuse uh, the spleen cells with myeloma cells and you produce hybridomas and then you cultivate in hat medium to produce antibodies you have read this in biochemistry and will be discussed uh, down the line with classes wherever we wherever we require antibodies and now we have a lot of antibodies available some examples of monoclonal antibodies are in transplant related immunosuppression you have bacilli bacilli eximab dactizumab Uh, Muro uh, monomonab, which are against interleukin-2 receptor on CD cells. You have TNF alpha antibodies, like infliximab, adalizumab, adalimumab. Then you have infectious diseases. You have antibodies like palibizumab against the fusion protein of RSV, a respiratory insufficient virus, a respiratory virus. In cancers, you have rituximab, which is against CD20 molecule, uh, trastuzumab against e, uh, epidermal growth factor in breast cancer, and rituximab for NHLs, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So 
uh, tumor necrosis factor antibodies are used against in rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid undifferentiated polyspondylo arthropathies and in regional alleitis or Crohn's disease. So many of these immunological antibodies are now produced by hybridomas and are useful therapeutically. And a myriad of antibodies are available now against many in, uh, infectious and non-infectious and in cancers also. So with this I finish the class on immunology. Uh, once we have active classes physically, we'll, we can discuss any doubts which you have. And remember, this is just a primer. You have been taught biochemistry in, bio, in, in uh, immunology in biochemistry classes. You will be again reiterated the same in pathology. And whatever is required for microbiology and infections, we will be discussing with our individual organisms also. Thank you so much.